我哋應該夠 column。Right, we have a quorum, so let's invite the administration in. Good morning, everyone. This is the appointed time, and we have from the quorum. And may I welcome from the administration Mr. Jackie Liu, Principal Assistant Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury Financial Services, Ms. Karen Kemp. Executive Director, Banking Policy, HKMA, and Mr. Richard Ju, Head of Banking Policy, HKMA, and Mr. Ng, Government Counsel, DOJ, and Mr. Michael Lam, Senior Assistant Law Draftman, and Ms. Samantha Yao, Senior Manager, Banking Policy, HKMA. So, welcome everyone to this second meeting of the subcommittee. After the last meeting, right, in relation to the last meeting, uh, we are going to follow up on several issues uh, raised. And the last time, members agreed to Invite the B, uh, Banking Advisory Committee, the, uh, the Deposit Taking Committee, Advisory Committee, the uh, Hong Kong uh, Restricted License Bank, and DTC Association, and the HCAP to submit their written uh, submissions on the three subsidiary legislations. The reply from these organizations have been forwarded to members. Under paper CP bracket one one seven five slash twelve thirteen bracket one two three, I uh, believe that members have noted the papers. Now, apart from receiving these submissions, I'd also like to reflect some of the views from the banking sector. Now, on the implementation of Basel III and the relevant requirements on the, gen uh, the 1st of January 2013, there have been reports that um, there is a delay, and some organizations have sa said that the FSA uh, issued a declaration on the 1st of August this year stating that it's impossible for the UK to implement Basel III on the 1st of January 2013. And for the United States, the Federal Reserve uh, also issued a joint declaration on the 9th of November, stating that because of various views received, there was uh, no expectation of the implementation of Basel III on the 1st of January this year. And this is also the concern of our banking sector, and they'd like to express this view through me. And that is, we should not be uh, one of the first places to implement Basel III. We should not be pioneers. And I'd like to reflect this view on behalf of the banking sector. I'd like to ask the administration for any response, Mr. Liu. Uh, I'll defer to a representative from HKMA. Who would like to 
Yes, Ms. Kim. Uh, first of all, I would note that the Basel Committee itself has not changed its implementation date. For the first phase of Basel III, that remains the 1st of January 2012. Uh, other Asian regulators are poised to go ahead on the 1st of January 2013. Sorry, I said 2012, I meant 2013. Uh, so, for instance, Singapore has issued its rules, Australia has issued its rules, the mainland has issued its rules. So, uh, jurisdictions are moving towards the 1st of January 2013 date. We are aware that the U.S. announced on the 9th of November that there would be some delay in the U.S., However, in their announcement, the U.S. Uh, took care to refer to the fact that they take their international timing commitments very seriously and are working expeditiously to complete their rulemaking powers. Uh, the, 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 level, the, the, the U.S. has already undergone uh, a level two assessment by the Basel Committee, so its notice of proposed rulemaking and its proposed rules have been reviewed for compliance and the report that was published indicated a high degree of compliance with Basel III. So the U.S. are, are moving steadily towards the implementation of Basel III. Um, in terms of, of the, the capital held by the banks, even though Basel III is not actually in place in the U.S., um, the, the large banks that are included in the Federal Reserve's stress testing program uh, must show an ability to hold Tier 1 common risk-based capital, akin to CET1 under Basel III, of, of 5%. So even though Basel III is, is, not in, is not in force as such, the banks in the U.S. are moving towards the position where they will be in, in line with Basel III. Um, and also on the 9th of November, the U.S. announced the, the 2013 stress testing program uh, so that this, this, this process is going to continue going forward. Um, for the EU, um, again, we are aware that there is uh, some, some delay. Uh, there is a political process to be undertaken within the EU, and there is a trialogue uh, discussion going on between the Parliament, the Commission, and the EU Council. Um, on the, the 13th of November, it seems that there was a meeting of the Council for Economic and Financial Affairs um, where they discussed CRD4, which is the EU version of Basel III, and uh, they, they, there was a, a, a press release that referred to a commitment to reach an agreement with the Parliament before the end of the year. So the, I think the, they still uh, intend to reach political agreement on CRD4 within this year, and then it will be a question of uh, implementation next year. It's obviously not possible on the 31st of December to, 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 to make an agreement and have the banks implement immediately from the 1st of January. So there will be a lead in time. But so far as we are aware, both the EU and the US are moving towards Basel III implementation, Chen. Okay. Oh. All right, Mr. Tin. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm having a bad throat. <clears throat> if in the States and uh, in like UK, they're not going to implement it on the first part of um, 2013. Then if we implement it, then most of our banks have relationship or actually are part of the banks in New York and London. Then how would <clears throat> that particular multinational bank operate? If they don't have the Hong Kong, uh, I assume that would be a subsidiary of, let's say, uh, a larger, of a large bank. Just, I guess we're not supposed to use the names, but uh, then the bank that's headquartered in London or New York, if they're not implement, implementing it yet, and we're doing it, uh, how does that particular bank's internal management uh, comply to that? Or are we saying that it doesn't really matter? We could do it first because we're doing a better job. So we do it first, and they could follow suit later. I guess one answer must be that if an international bank have like 40 branches around the world, what do the countries have to do at first? So someone will have to start doing it, and if they all do it in the, the UK or London, New York does it later, they won't have trouble uh, implementing it. But I guess the chairman's question is maybe a lot of Hong Kong uh, people would ask, why do we want to be ahead of New York or London? After all, they're still the leading financial market in the world. I'm just talking New York London. And it seems the chairman said that both London and New York will not be implementing it uh, full steam ahead, uh, full steam ahead on 
January 31st could be at least go at the same pace as the New York and not be ahead of them. And if we do it ahead of them, are there any advantage to us? Maybe uh, reputation-wise, you could say we're leading New York London. But other than that, in real terms, are there any benefits? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Ms. Kim. Uh, Again, I would reiterate that the, the delay in the US and, and, the, and the EU is, is due to the, the circumstances prevailing there. The, the international regulatory reform effort spearheaded by the FSB and the Basel Committee uh, set the 1st of January 2013 as, as the timetable. So as members of the Basel Committee, the FSB, and, and working towards strengthening the financial system, the global financial system, <coughs> following the, the, the crisis, um, we, we, you know, we are committed to the 1st of January 2013. It, 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 we, we actually think that, that Basel III is, is useful, that the crisis showed that banks did not have enough capital. So, therefore, strengthening the resilience of banks, but with, a, with a, a, an extended time frame for implementation to enable them to, to, to support sustainable economic development, seems to us to be the most balanced way of proceeding. And so for that reason, we, we, we propose, as, a, as, as far as we are aware, other, other Asian regulators that are perhaps better placed to, to, to meet the standards to proceed. So, so Chairman, it seems the answer is that <clears throat> in EU, EU, they are not ready to implement. The main reason is the capital ratio. And if the point is that our banks is in such a good condition or better condition under our internal rules of HKMA, we are all in a position to do that, as the letter from uh, HK, sorry, Hong Kong Association of Banks said, that since we're meeting the criteria anyway, then we could uh, do it without much trouble. Uh, while if they can do it because of their capital ratio, then it's up to them. If we're not ready, then we'll have a problem. Since we're ready, then we're saying that why don't we do it first? So is that the main difference between EU and the states, the fact they cannot comply on January 2013 is because of sing singly one item is the capital ratio? I think, it, I think that's certainly a large contributing factor. I think there are, there are some other factors at play. So, for instance, for the U.S., they, they, they put out their consultation first in June, so it was relatively late. The, the reason being that they have to deal with the Dodd-Frank Act. Now, Basel, but the Basel um, capital regulatory capital framework uses external ratings for some of the approaches. The Dodd-Frank Act actually prohibits um, the U.S. regulators from using external ratings, again, largely because of what happened in the crisis, where the ratings for very certain products were, were not found um, to, to perform as expected. So, so the, in the U.S., if you like, they have to for, form their own version of Basel III in compliance with the Dodd-Frank Act. So the complexity of that, plus the fact that resource-wise they're producing hundreds and hundreds of sets of rules under Dodd-Frank, um, has, has inevitably slowed them down. So they, they began, I think, consulting in June. They extended the consultation period until um, towards the end of October. So, so um, they, they've just got the comments back. So, so, so they have a, a sort of a, a, a volume of work and a, a deal of complexity to deal with. Um, again, in the EU, there was uh, some concerns over the summer about the way the, the EU have decided to do a single rule book so Basel standards are usually, well, are a minimum standard. In the EU, they decided to try to um, make sure that individual members did not go above that minimum in order to sort of conform the single rule across the EU. Some jurisdictions were very vociferous in their objection to that, including the UK, Sweden. So they had to come to a, a compromise solution on that over the summer. Um, I understand also that for some reason within their, their capital requirement. They have bonus restrictions, which have nothing to do with the capital, but have gone into there, so there's a, a political element to that. So I think all of these combined factors, plus, frankly, the fact that they're working on banking union as well, at the same time, have, have sort of slowed down the process in the EU. So again, they have competing demands upon them that are coming into it. So capital is one thing, but there are, I think, some surrounding factors that are also militating towards delay. Uh, Chairman, if members are not uh, have, have any specific question to ask yet, may I continue with um, two short words? Um, okay. 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 Uh, two short words.
Please go on. First one is we have two submissions. It's the DTC Association and the Hong Kong Association of Banks. Uh, we, we have two copies. Are we saying that when we want to get the industry's view, these are the two main sort of associations that's related to this whole Basel III uh, yeah. arrangements, and there's no further association that might have a view that we had not written for them for view or they had not responded. These are the, the two major twos. Yes, okay. these are the, so, the two major twos. And then on the HK uh, Association of Banks, it seems their reply is a bit longer. Uh, they're saying, for example, in paragraph two, in general, we're supportive of the principle of that topic. It seems they, are, they use the word supportive, they use the word principle. Uh, they follow this, we reinforce Hong Kong position. Then at the bottom of that page, they're saying between different banks according to the individual circumstances such as size, financial position, business and group nature, it seems they do think that even if we do it in Hong Kong now, you have to base on these, blah, blah, blah. Then some will have an easier time complying with it. Some might have a, a, a difficult time complying it. So would our position be that once this is set up, we do give them a sort of a grace period, I don't know, six months, nine months, so that the big banks that meet all these will have an easier time to do it, and the other ones will have a chance uh, to do it? Or will you say that if they don't meet it by a certain deadline, in certain clauses they will be penalized? Uh, it, we, we've been um, talking to the banks for a, a long time on, <coughs> on Basel III, and they have already um, Capital, plan, capital planning arrangements, so they have been working towards compliance with these, uh, the, the, the uh, content of this set of rules with effect from the 1st of January 20, 2013. Um, I think that the, the point that HCAB are, are making is that, it, that there may be variation across banks. If, if you have a, uh, a big derivative uh, operation, then you will be affected by the, some of the new charges relating to derivatives. If, if, your, if your capital base has less common equity, then you may, need to, you may be looking to raise more common equity, although it, with Hong Kong banks, they tend to hold a lot of common equity, so the new common equity tier one ratio should not be a problem for them. Oh, uh, <coughs> yeah. Mr. Leung. Perhaps I would also follow up on the letter from the Hong Kong Association of Banks. It seems that uh, they are making two very interesting points that I do not understand how they would work out in practice. The first point that they made is the one under uh, para 2, where they made the point that uh, they believe it is imperative that a level regulatory playing field is created and that the Basel III proposals are implemented globally. Over the page, they are saying, uh, top of the page, that uh, second line, we also note that as part of the consultation process, the Hong Kong MA have undertaken to monitor Basel III implementation developments in other major jurisdictions, for example, the EU and US, to ensure there is no competitive disadvantage to, to authorized institutions in Hong Kong. Now, perhaps the chairman can also enlighten me on this. What if, as a result of the monitoring process, some banks or the Hong Kong Association of Banks as a whole, comes to the view that by implementing Basel III uh, in Hong Kong on 1st of January 2013, would place Hong Kong banks in a disadvantage when competing with EU banks and US banks. And they are not satisfied that a level regulatory playing field is being created. Can they be exempted from compliance? with the rules that we are making today. Thank you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, no, they, they, won't, they won't be exempted from compliance. Okay. But, so you, you are correct, sir. No, what, 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 we've, uh, we, what we've said to um, the Hong Kong Association of Banks as the consultation process has unfolded is that we will monitor the way in which implementation takes place in other jurisdictions. So as we discussed last time, you have the Basel text, but each jurisdiction has to transpose that into its own legal framework. 
And so um, in, in sometimes in that transposition, changes may be made. We've made a few ourselves that, that, that we've outlined. Uh, other jurisdictions may do the same, and we would be interested to see if any of those changes um, materially change the, the, the effect of Basel III on their banks. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. Um, so we, we have been looking uh, at the, the work that the Basel Committee itself has been doing on the US and the EU uh, in terms of the, the, their assessment of compliance on the draft rules, and there will be a follow-up to that when the final rules are issued. So it's, it's, an, it's, what I would, it's an ongoing process. It's not necessarily the case that if the EU changes something, then we would automatically follow suit. We will consider what is suitable in Hong Kong, whether it's a major disadvantage, whether from a prudential concern we think we should still stick to the Basel III uh, principle, or, wh or whether we should, we, we should introduce some flexibility. Mm -hmm. may follow up. I think this is the point that the Honorable James Teen has been following. Uh, it seems that the Hong Kong Association of Banks is a bit worried that by compliance uh, with the rules that we are making today would somehow put our banks in a disadvantaged position when competing with other banks, for example in the US and in the EU, globally. That's why they are making the point under Para 2 that there had to be a level regulatory playing field. If compliance means Hong Kong banks are being penalized, then of course we as legislators are concerned that we should not put our banks in a disadvantaged position. Uh, my question, and I think similar question from the Honorable James team, whether that would turn out to be the case. That is our worry. Hmm. As, uh, I think we, we should uh, remember to some extent why, why we're doing what we're doing. The crisis showed that the existing system, the Basel II system, um, allowed banks to operate with less capital than it turned out that they needed. Times had moved on. Um, banking uh, had, had, had changed, and banks were running more, perhaps more risk than the capital, the existing capital system w was designed to support. So, so, as a result of the crisis, it is generally agreed that banks need to hold more and better quality capital. But whilst in a crisis situation you could make the crisis worse if you implement everything immediately and say, in a perfect world, this is what I want, now, now, now do this. So, so the Basel III process is, is designed to be a balance. It's designed to raise the, the level and quality of banks' capital, which we think is a good thing. It's designed to do this over an extended implementation period so that uh, it, that does not, the, the raising of the new capital, the, the, the new standards, do not impede upon banks' normal credit intermediation activities. So, so we think Basel III is a good thing. So it's not something that, that, that we are just following because everybody else is following. We think it's good. And so we think our banks should, should um, should, should be moving towards this. And I think they think the same in the, in the EU and in the US. It is just that they are unfortunately delayed by other issues um, uh, that, are, that are affecting their jurisdictions, which were indeed the jurisdictions worst affected by the crisis. Chairman, uh, uh, with your permission, I think we are talking at cross purposes here. Um, <laughs> uh, they, of course, I... I understand fully what uh, Ms. Camp is trying to tell us, that this is for the good of everybody, that uh, the Basel III more stringent uh, requirements of capital standards, etc., should be applied to the banks in Hong Kong. Uh, but, Chairman, I must first confess that I'm no <laughs> expert in banking operation. Uh, the Chairman certainly is. But uh, it seems that from the letter that we are looking at, dated the 15th of November, from the Hong Kong Association of Banks, they are worried, as experts in the banking operation, that uh, a level regulatory playing field may not be created on the 1st of January 2013. And from the point that I read to you, uh, Ms. Kemp, over the page on page two of their letter, it seems that... Uh, they are envisaging a situation 
that uh, investors may decide to go somewhere else than Hong Kong because those places, in those places, their banks have not been required to live up to the Basel Street most stringent standards. So as an investor deciding on which market or which or banks in which market to go to for investment purposes, for what they want to achieve, they may take advantage of this window of difference between the regulatory framework in Hong Kong, which is Basel III compliant, and some other markets where banks are not yet required to uh, live up to the Basel III standard. I think the point that uh, worries us uh, and apparently the Hong Kong Association of Banks was that point. Uh, and Chairman, I don't think that point has been addressed. Hey. I, I think from for an investor uh, point of view, the, the stronger the bank, the better. So I think that um, I, I think it would almost go the other way, that if you haven't implemented Basel standards and your banks are perceived to be weaker, they might find it more difficult in attracting investors. So from, from the point of view of, of, of banks' funding, there may be advantages uh, in, a, in adopting the more stringent standards. Well, Chairman, I, I don't pretend to be expert here. If the Hong Kong Association of Banks uh, is only prepared to go as far as what we are reading in the letter 15th of November 2002, then I would rest my case here. Okay. Okay. Uh, Xin Yu. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm reading news. Uh, Mr. Xin. Could be finalized, Basel III could be finalized in December, says, uh, you know, Sabiot, uh finance ministers. Uh, what the news uh, I've learned is, uh, you know, the European minister, fin finance minister is still discussing some sort of rules. So I think uh, I just want to echo some of my, the, you know, the points raised by some of our colleagues. It seems that the uh, even the US, sec U.S. Treasury is saying, you know, they are not implementing Basel III on 1st of January uh, 2013. Uh, so, does, uh, so do many of the European countries. So could you tell me, uh, to be more exact, you know, what, kind, uh, what countries will be ready, uh, will be implementing on 1st of January, and uh, see if we need to follow suit uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the banks are subtly saying, you know, we, we would like to comply, but no need to hurry. Uh, that's the message that I read through lines of the letter. Thank you. Um, okay, Australia has issued its, its final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. Mainland China has issued its uh, final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. India has issued its final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. Japan has issued its final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. Singapore has issued final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. Switzerland has issued final rules to take effect on the 1st of January. Uh, Canada directed its banks uh, in February two, um, 2011 to meet the new CET1 standard as of the 1st of January. So those ones we know are definite. Um, Korea, we know, issued a draft regulation in September 2012. Um, and I think Indonesia is still consulting. Uh, on Indo they, they issued a draft in June 2012. May I focus on several countries like the UK, uh, the no, US, no, have their uh, you know, more exact timetable? <clears throat> uh, it, I, how about Germany? Uh, you know, these three big countries, for example. Okay, the, the, the UK and Germany are obviously bound by the EU timetable in the sense that they will implement in their jurisdictions CRD4, the, the European uh, Directive, Capital Requirement Directive. Mm. So they, they, it's difficult for them to implement before CRD4 uh, is, is finalised. So they're bundling have, with the European Union? Yes. Okay. So, but having, having said that, both um, of those, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago we saw the Germans issued some um, preparatory legislation, so they're waiting for CRD4 to come into effect. And I think the UK also issued 
issued some transitional provisions for consultation. So they are preparing for CRD4, but for both of those jurisdictions, it will be CRD4 that, comes, uh, that, that, that they need to come into effect first. Um, as I said earlier, for the USA, they have announced the delay, but they, they were very um, careful to, to note that they are very cognizant of their uh, international uh, timing commitments and that they are working expeditiously to finalise the rulemaking process. But, but no firm timetable. All right, so to summarise um, our discussion, is focused on the concerns raised by banks, and we get the feeling from these submissions that there is this concern uh, that uh, Hong Kong will be put to a disadvantaged position once it is implemented. So I'd like to invite the HMA or the administration to give us information on the timetable for the um, proposed implementation of Basel III in various countries and jurisdictions. And we have had a thorough discussion. I believe we have relayed our concern of the banking sector to the administration and the possible um, disadvantages that will face Hong Kong if our implementation times are different from other countries. So um, without causing any delay to the scrutiny of the subledge, um, I'd like to uh, ask the administration and the HKMA to reconsider uh, any alternative method in implementing the Basel III, or uh, if uh, there is any second thought on the timetable of implementation. And this is uh, something for the HMA and the administration to consider. Ms. Tin, uh, I agree with you, Chairman. But on the other hand, can we consider asking our Secretariat to send a letter to HCAP and ask for its response? in relation to the points raised by us today, because they seem to have uh, be implying uh, this, but we need to uh, get a clear message from them. I'm talking about the two uh, paragraphs, um, level regulatory playing field and imperative implemented globally. Well, it says implemented globally, but it didn't say all, uh, at the same time. So. Can we write a letter to HCAP and ask for their response? Uh, I wonder if Secretariat can do that. We can send a letter and invite the HCAP to clarify the few points raised in its letter, in particular a level regulatory playing field and the implementation of the cap, uh, capital requirements in UK and US. We can ask for their clarification. All right, uh, we should do that, and I believe that the administration and the HMA are clear about members' concern. So uh, let's continue with the scrutiny, and uh, this supplement can be made later on. So now in relation to the scrutiny, any further proposal from the administration. Please brief us on the relevant paper. Mr. Liu. Thank you, Chairman. At the last meeting held on the 5th of November, members asked the administration to provide another paper to the subcommittee to clarify two points. One is in relation to Banking specification of multilateral development bank amendment notice 2012, uh, whether there are appropriate Chinese translations for the banks and bodies specified in section 2 of the notice. And the administration and the HKMA were asked to provide a paper setting out 
the major differences and modifications in the rules for implementing Basel III in Hong Kong from the relevant um, standards promulgated by Basel Commission Committee. And uh, we were asked to state our reasons and justifications for making the changes as well as views of the banking sector on the changes. Now, we have already uh, issued a paper uh, in relation to the uh, these two points. Now, in relation to banking uh, specification of multilateral development bank amendment notice 2012, last time a member raised the question that while scrutinizing this notice in relation to the translation of certain bank names, such names were not included in the uh, notice. And I'd like to stress that the amendment is to include MRGA in the notice. And I thank members for raising this issue, and that is some of the English names of banks under this uh, multilateral development bank have not been translated into Chinese. And I have sought legal advice, and uh, it is suggested that there is no uh, impact on the operation of the rule. And we're still uh, considering this point because uh, during the last time, we have not um, discovered any new Chinese names or Chinese translations of the names of banks, and we will confirm uh, with the banks, if necessary, uh, their official Chinese names. And um, once we finish the inquiry and review, the administration undertakes that uh, through such a law amendment bills in the future, the um, the um, legislative amendments can be introduced. Uh, that is through the statute law miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, on the major differences in the rules, uh, would you like to clarify this issue? At the meeting last time, because of the uh, rather uh, draconian requirements under this ca um, capital framework, we were asked to prepare a paper setting out the major differences in the rules um, to be implemented in Hong Kong from the uh, Basel III standards. And uh, the administration is happy to provide such information. In the paper issued to members, we have include, in, included in the annex a table stating the difference uh, between the banking capital amendment rules and Basel III text. Uh, this will help our scrutiny of the text. Yes, Ms. Kem? Um, the, the main difference um, between the uh, banking capital rules and Basel III is that Basel III will allow unrealized gains on property revaluation to be included within common equity tier one capital without limit. Um, the banking capital rules, in contrast, allow recognition only in tier two capital with a 55% haircut. So only 45% of property revaluation gains can be recognized and only in the lower tier of capital. Um, this reflects the existing situation under our existing capital rules in Hong Kong. Um, and we've chosen to, to follow this route rather than adopt the Basel III standard due largely to concerns about the historical volatility of prices of commercial property in Hong Kong. So our concern is that by allowing property revaluation gains into common equity tier one, we will introduce uh, significant volatility into the common equity tier one ratio, which could have an adverse impact on banks' ability to support or continue lending activities if in future there were to be any rapid or significant fall in property prices.
The other um, deviations from Basel III are, are more minor. Um, the next item concerns deferred tax assets and mortgage servicing rights. Uh, the, these can be recognized with, within uh, a threshold within the Basel III uh, approach, but we uh, do not propose to recognize them as capital uh, under the banking capital rules. Our reasons being that we, we have reservations about the genuine loss absorption capacity of these items. So deferred tax assets uh, for timing differences can only be reversed over time. So at best they represent uh, future potential for reducing profits tax and increasing earnings. Uh, we don't think that that is, is capital. And mortgage servicing rights are, are created by capitalizing future income streams from the servicing of mortgage loans which have been sold. This is important in the United States, but they are not common in Hong Kong. And so we have no experience locally on which to, to found a judgment as to whether there would be uh, continued availability of income from mortgage servicing rights to a bank in times of stress. The, the third item in the table, Chairman, is um, uh, what, what I would characterize as an anti-avoidance provision. Um, generally, capital instruments are, are deducted from, from capital under, under Basel III, but a capital investment, particularly if it were to be in a connected company, um, might be characterized as a, as a loan. It could be a perpetual loan. So we included a provision um, into the, the banking capital rules allowing the HKMA to, to recapitalize recharacterize something like that um, uh, as a capital investment if the lending uh, institution cannot demonstrate that it's actually been incurred in the ordinary course of business. Again, this largely reflects the existing position um, under the capital rules in Hong Kong. Hi. Uh, uh, Karen, I, I hope you don't mind. You already went through three uh, items. Could we stop here so we can have a, a discussion on that? But Chairman, first, I'd like to declare my interest, as I am in the property business and I do borrow banks on some of the projects I do. Carol, on the first point you, you mentioned, <clears throat> you're saying that under the new rule, the 55% of unrealized gain, of course, firstly, I'm asking from the view of the borrower of the bank, the, a, a developer that borrows money from the bank. So are you saying that on my books, which is audited, if the property is worth so much, you're not saying 55% of that value. You're saying that if it's an unrealized gain, uh, for example, if the property was bought for one million and now it's worth one and a half million, you're saying that one and a half minus one, that $500,000 gain, you're only taking 55% of that as an unrealized gain. And that would be allowable under the Basel III for the bank to take the value of my property and lend me according to that value. No, no sorry, I, I, maybe I've, I've confused. So this 55 percent? So, so I, I may have confused the issue a bit. Um, what, what we're looking at is, is property that's owned by the bank. So the bank is using it, it's either using it for its branches. Not the borrowers, but the bank's own no, property. No, the bank's own property. So if that's being um, revalued and the value is, is, is going up significantly, but there are unrealized gains in the sense that the bank hasn't sold the property, so it hasn't got the money, it's just got a, a paper mm. gain, mm. then we are very nervous about allowing all of that paper gain into what will be the, the most important indicator of the bank's strength, common equity, tier one capital. So we prefer to, to, to go with the status quo on this, which we're already doing, which is to say we will recognize 45% of that gain. So 55% is, is not counted, and we will recognize it in the lower tier of capital, tier two capital. So um, the, 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 the different tiers of capital have slightly different characteristics. So the, the tier one capital is regarded um, as, as going concern capital. It should be able to absorb losses and allow the bank to continue in business. Tier two capital is perhaps more gone concern capital, so it should absorb losses upon um, insolvency. But that's not much use for the bank to be able to continue in business. So. Um, Generally speaking, what we propose to stick with the status quo and not allow <coughs> unrealized property gains into common equity tier one. Uh, the chairman, thank you for that clarification. So it's nothing to do with borrowers. But even in that scenario, I'm uh, sorry because maybe in Hong Kong it's too small, I have to use names. But let's say you use HSBC. Their main building in Central might be built 30 years ago at this price. 
and now the uh, revaluation might be three times of what's it worth. So you're saying that unrealized gain is what that's all that book. So for a new bank who just bought a building last year, then realized gain could be very small. And that 55% might not mean much. But if you take a bank like, for example, HSBC, the building here, I'm sure the current market value may be three, four times of what they were originally booked at and the book cost. So that would be a, a big haircut. Uh, is, uh, is that what we're saying that uh, we would do? Y yes, essentially what we're saying is that um, as long as the gain remains unrealized. So um, I, I believe it may have happened with uh, property in, in the UK. If you sell and you, you, you obtain the, the, the funds, the, the money, then it becomes a realized gain. But as long as it remains unrealized, it doesn't get counted as common equity tier one capital for, for, the, for the purposes of the capital rules. Mm. And that would certainly in turn affect the borrowing power of that bank because if that's not counted into capital, then the money they can lend up to SMEs or whatever in Hong Kong to personal mortgages, that would in proportion also be reduced because of uh, the, safe, uh, the safe position of this unrealized gain, regardless of the cost. I can see the unrealized gain is one or two years. Well, it's not that much. But if the bank uh, uh, had an uh, old building, that would make a difference. And may I, on the same point, ask if the bank transferred the property to another subsidiary, also wholly owned, then you could be deemed as a realized gain. We don't have capital gain tax, so the bank can do that. And then that all becomes a realized gain. Then are you saying that 55% will not apply? Do you want to <coughs> we have an anti avoidance provision. Would that be considered as anti avoidance? <coughs> because you say unrealized gain, so I'm realizing it. But, this but, but it's realized within the, the same consolidation group. Okay, that's considered avoidance, yeah. well, which is the third part you just talked about. Yeah. Okay, but please comment. Are you saying that that should not, uh, that could not be, uh, they, they could not do that? Well, we, we, we have a, a, an anti-avoidance provision that would, would, would stop that because that, that would just be realizing the gain within the group, but there's no new money that, that's actually coming to the group to support the group's lending. Okay. So uh, going forward, you, you will see this. Yeah, because he is Well, you talk about revaluation. Here, uh, the percentage is set at a more conservative level because of the volatility in the property market. So uh, this is drawing a line where there is a revaluation. I don't think uh, this is related to uh, the collateral of uh, mortgages. No, no, they do not use revaluation, rather unrealized gain. Yes, yes. Uh, the uh, difference after revaluation is regarded as unrealized uh, gain. So it's just revaluation. All right, I think uh, we have had the discussion here. Off. A supplement? And, um, the uh, anti-avoidance that Karen is referring to um, uh, in relation to uh, a bank as an uh, example uh, given by uh, uh, Mr. Tin is uh, uh, concerning, um, uh, for example, a bank selling a property to uh, subsidiaries and in such a way realize gain. And uh, that can, uh, is actually addressed by uh, Section 38, um, uh, Subsection 2, uh, D uh, in the um, Basel Three rules. Yeah. That's just for members' information. Uh, can we go on, Chairman? Sorry. Um, yeah, the final, the final two, fourth and fifth points are, are, are rather uh, technical um, points relating to um, a formula for calculating uh, something called a credit valuation adjustment uh, capital charge. Um, 
During the crisis, uh, a lot of losses actually suffered by banks were not suffered from, from default of counterparties, but rather from, from the, the, the downgrading of counterparties. So the mark-to-market value of the contract with the counterparties um, fell because the counterparties were downgraded. So Basel III has introduced something called a credit valuation adjustment risk charge so that banks will hold capital against that, that risk of uh, mark-to-market losses. But in calculating um, this, this charge, um, you, you need to, um, banks need to, to map um, a, an external rating for a counterparty, AAA, AA, whatever, to, 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 to get a weight for that counterparty, and that weight then goes into the formula to, to calculate the, the CVA charge. And we have, um, we, we've made two adjustments in this area. The first relates to something that, that, that's historical. Um, at the request of some authorised institutions, we already recognise in the banking capital rules um, ratings from three Indian rating agencies for Indian corporates. And we're mapping um, those mapping external ratings to get the weight to go into the CVA calculation, we need to accommodate those Indian ECAI, uh, those Indian credit rating agency ratings. Um, and we follow the Reserve Bank of India's mappings of those Indian uh, ratings to obtain the, the credit quality grades necessary to, to assess the risk in the existing banking capital rules. And those are slightly different from the mapping of the international rating agencies like Moody's, Standard & Poor's, etc. So, so we have made an adjustment in the CVA calculation just basically to reflect the, that, that difference that we're dealing with two sets of rating agencies, international rating agencies and Indian rating agencies. Um, and the final um, point in, in point five is, again, uh, along similar lines. For determining the weight applicable to a counterparty to calculate the CVA charge, where the counterparty doesn't have an external rating from any uh, rating agency, then um, under Basel III there's a need to map a bank's internal rating to the external rating to get the weight. Um, now, for, for banks that, that use, adopt the internal ratings-based system for calculating their regulatory capital, they obviously have internal ratings, internal ratings-based system. So they can map their internal ratings to the external ratings through a mapping scheme that's approved by us. But for smaller banks that don't use um, the internal ratings-based system, they're not IRB banks, as we say. For simplicity, we've allowed them to assign a flat weight of 1%, which corresponds to a, a triple B rating. Um, now, we, we, we've done that because we think the 1% is a sort of reasonable cost-benefit analysis, being sort of a, a fair conservative approximation of what would be the average weight of a pool of counterparties. So it's to, to stop small banks having to develop a sort of a rating system so that they can have an internal rating to map to an external rating to get, a, to get the weight for this particular calculation. So we've gone for a, a flat 1%. We've consulted the industry about this, and the industry have uh, indicated that that is acceptable to them. Mm. So it's a bit technical. Okay. So uh, the major differences between the rules and uh, the Basel III requirements uh, have been uh, set out in the table. There are mainly five. So uh, do we have to go on with the clause by clause scrutiny of the English text? Not necessary? No. Uh, members, the administration has uh, briefed us on the uh, differences or modifications. So uh, usually, uh, the our legal advisor uh, will uh, discuss with the administration in relation to the clauses and uh, if. So we we'll also invite our legal advisor to report to us uh, his um, examination of the Chinese text. Yes, we already uh, vetted the uh, Chinese text with some drafting points. Uh, 
ask to uh, seek clarification from the administration, and uh, the administration has responded to our uh, queries, and we don't have any follow up. No, no further follow up. Now, let's take a look at the legislative timetable. The uh, scrutiny period was extended at the last sitting to the 12th of December this year. Uh, the time for giving notice of amendment is the 5th of December. Uh, report to the House Committee, the 30th of November. So please note the three dates I just mentioned. So if uh, there are any amendments, please uh, give notice by the 5th of December. And then on the 30th of November, I'm going to uh, make a report to the House Committee of our work. So, do members agree that I, as chairman of the subcommittee, give a report to the House Committee uh, so that I can uh, brief the House Committee uh, on the work of this subcommittee? All right, if members are agreeable. I will make arrangements according to this timetable. And uh, do 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 we need further meetings? So I'd like to consult members. There are still outstanding papers, or actually, we would like to uh, consult the. HCAP further. So do we need to meet once again or do we just uh, do it by circulation of papers, Mr. Tian? Well, I think it's okay by circulation of papers. Well, that ends our scrutiny of the sub -leg. If necessary, we can uh, meet further. I thank officials for attending the meeting. I thank members for their contribution. Thank you, Secretariat. Thank you.